Do you need tips for Copic coloring digital stamps? You're in luck because I have 13 tips in 13 minutes on how to Copic color digital stamps and some tips on setting up your digital stamps, how to get them on paper so that you can color them and just tips to make it easier for you. My first tip for Copic coloring digital stamps is to print with a laser printer. If you have a color laser printer, that's even better for some more things we'll get into later. Um, but you can start Copic coloring right away with a laser printer. Tip number two, if you have an inkjet printer, some of them are compatible with Copic markers. You may need to heat set it or let the ink sit overnight in order for it to not smear. So you'll have to do some testing with that. My third tip is to print on a piece of paper that's larger than what you need. Here you can see that I reduced the size of the card layout so that I would have a white border around my card. That's tip number four. If you print on a larger piece of paper, you have room to swatch your colors, and I'll show more of that later in this video. Tip number five is to explore using digital papers in your designs. So I dropped in a digital paper behind this stamp and I can do that because the image has a transparent background with a white fill underneath the image that you're going to color. So digital papers are awesome because they reduce the amount of time that you need to spend coloring. Let's get into the coloring of the image and I'll share some more tips as we go along. I'm starting off with Copic marker YG03 and YG17, and all of the markers for this first card are listed over there on the left-hand side. So I mentioned transparent images. That is tip number, what are we up to, six? Try and find um, digital stamps with a transparent background and the white fill, because that, like I said, is going to allow you to use those digital papers and drop in different kinds of backgrounds, and that's a huge help. It also allows you to stack the images on top of the other and arrange them. So that white fill is super helpful. The other thing that I would recommend is a manual feed on your printer. Now that might not be something that you can control. If you don't have a manual feed option on your printer where it takes in the paper from the front and shoots it straight out the back rather than curling it around and making it do a U-turn around the spooler or of the automatic feed, that can be really hard on heavyweight cardstock. So if you don't have a manual feed on your printer, then what I would recommend is try coloring on premium copy paper. I know that sounds strange. Most of us are used to using Nina Classic Cross Solar White or maybe Copic Express paper, but I will link some paper down below that I've had great success with. In fact, this image is colored on the premium copy paper, and you can put that in your automatic feeder and it works fantastic. Um, so that was tip number seven. Copic coloring on a glass mat is tip number eight. I've mentioned this before in some of my videos. It can extend the amount of time that you have to blend. Now in this particular case, I started off with my first leaf up top with the, the correct shading. Then when I got to the leaf on the bottom, I realized that I put the darker color at the top and my highlight at the bottom, which was opposite of the leaf on the top. So now I'm going back in with more marker and then also my colorless blender to try and correct this error. My issue that I'm having right now is that I'm using my colorless blender directly on my glass mat. If you think about how a colorless blender works and you think about how a glass mat works, so the glass mat is going to reduce the evaporation of your ink, which gives you a longer blend time. Your colorless blender is actually going to help you push the ink. It doesn't erase the ink. It helps you push the ink into a different area. If you're trying to push the ink into a non-absorbent surface like the glass mat, it's just gonna come back up through your paper. So what you need to do is grab another piece of cardstock or better yet, a tissue or a paper towel and put that under your card like I've done here and then use your colorless blender. Then you can press it down into the paper below it. You can see I'm trying to press that ink down with my finger. I'm gonna kind of use a microfiber cloth to kind of push that ink down into the blotter paper that I have below it. And you can see that that green went down into the cardstock below it. So don't use your colorless blender on your glass mat. Get a 
piece of blotter paper down below it. And that is tip number nine. Okay, whew, we got through nine tips in the first five minutes, so let's slow down a bit and enjoy a little bit of coloring here. So I'm just using some typical flicking strokes here. Um, and if you remember back to tip number three, I said uh, if you print on larger paper, you can use the rest of the paper for swatching, which is great. You can also label the colors that you use if you need to know that for a blog post or to share it on social media or any of that kind of stuff. Bonus tip is when you think about coloring, think about it in situational terms. So sometimes I color light to dark, sometimes I color dark to light, and it really depends on the situation. I'll come back to that tip in just a minute. Tip number 10 is to alter the stamp as needed after you already have it printed and you've started coloring. If it's missing something, you need to draw something in, go for it. Grab your pen, grab your markers, and alter it as needed. My tip number 11 is to, if I have a white border around my card layout like this, then I will typically trim it with a rectangle die. This is an A2 size die or four and a quarter by five and a half. I find it much easier to get a perfect trim this way. I can get it lined up visually equal this way. However, if the card layout extends all the way to four and a quarter by five and a half, I find it easier to take that to my trimmer because I wouldn't be able to see the edges underneath the die. I hope that makes sense. Tip number 12 is to grab a pencil and a white charcoal pencil and add some shadows and highlights to your card. I do this with most of my cards, whether it's watercolor, Copic, or any other type of medium. Another way that you can do this though, is you can add a drop shadow digitally before you even print it. I'll link a video in the top right corner that teaches you how to set up your images in Macintosh pages, and hopefully you can translate that to Word as well. Okay, we've moved on to the second card here, and you can see that I dropped in a digital paper behind this one as well. I actually show you how to set up these cards in that video that I just referenced, so be sure to check that out if you're unsure of how to use digital stamps and get them on your paper. It's a great video, and I hope you find it really helpful. Let's go back to that situational coloring that I spoke about earlier. So. There's not a right or wrong way to color, you guys. Um, whether you're a light to dark artist or a dark to light colorist, um, either one of those is totally fine. I do both and I tend to do it based on the situation. So if I have a very large area to cover, then I'll probably start with the lightest color to put down a base layer of color so that I have ink down on the paper that I can blend those other colors with because it's gonna take me longer to get through a large area. Whereas if I'm working in a smaller area, then I may start with my dark color, like these little segments here. I'm starting with my darkest color, putting down a really small amount, then I come in with my mid-tone, and then I come in with my lightest color. And that helps me kind of gauge and prevent putting down too much ink in a small area, like I did in those green leaves earlier in the video. I put down so much ink trying to get my shading right there that it started to bleed outside the lines and then I had to fix that with the colorless blender. So starting dark to light in these small areas helps me manage the amount of ink that's going down on the page and it helps prevent bleeding outside the lines. Tip number 13 is to turn your paper. This seems so basic, you guys. You guys see me do it all the time. Some of you comment on like, I'm giving you whiplash because I'm flipping my paper around, especially if I'm doing Zentangle drawing, I'm flipping the paper around and turning it. The reason you wanna turn your paper is because most people have a preferred direction to flick. Most people have a more natural flick in one direction versus the other. For me, it's away from me. And so I turn my paper to get that angle right so that it feels comfortable and I get a natural flick. You're gonna get a better blend that way. Now, your direction might be different than my direction. Whatever the direction is for you, that's the right direction. Just make sure you turn your paper so that you're in the most comfortable position to get the best blend. Here you can see I've put my darkest colors on the left and then as I get over towards the right side, I've left a white space, but I wanted a little bit more. I kind of got a little overzealous. So I'm going in with my colorless blender and I'm pushing that ink kind of back in towards the blue. So this time I'm not trying to get rid of a spot that's outside the line. 
So I don't really need like a blotter paper under there. I hope this makes sense because I'm just pushing the ink back into itself. I, I want it to still stay in that blue container. I'm not trying to get rid of it. I'm just trying to add a little bit more white on that edge. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, let's see, another tip, tip number 14 we'll say, we're getting some extra bonus ones in here. Make sure you jump outside of your color families. Like right now, I've done the B90s for that little ruffly area. I've done the V0s for the purple flowers. I've kind of stuck with the yellow greens for the leaves. It's looking pretty boring, you guys. Like that's not exciting at all. You really want to jump outside of your color families for your individual elements and mix up your colors. And you're going to see me do that with the flowers. I'm actually going to add teal to those flowers and these little egg or orb things that you see down at the bottom. I'm going to have a whole mix of colors inside of those. That's going to make your composition more interesting. And if you look at nature, most things are not one solid color. Most things are a mix of colors, a mix of different colors in the shadows. So you want to kind of mix that up. Otherwise things start to look pretty flat and pretty artificial. So if you missed my other videos, this was part of the Daniel Smith watercolor swatch book series that I do. And this was for yellow ochre. This time around, um, per your request, I created a digital stamp set to go along with the swatch video. So I'll link them in the top right hand corner. Part one was draw with me where we drew the Zentangled journal page and that went into the digital stamp set for those of you who didn't actually want to draw that with the Zentangle method. Part two was swatch with me where I swatched yellow ochre, or mixed yellow ochre with 29 of my other Daniel Smith watercolor paints and then swatched it on the Zentangled journal page. Part three was paint with me where I watercolored one of the A2 size cards that are part of the digital stamp set. And then I had two more card panels that are part of that digital stamp set and I'm Copic coloring those today. The fifth video in this series was kind of like an extra one and that, as I said already, was the video that teaches you how to set up your digital images and how to print them using Microsoft Pages. So this one Zentangle journal page actually ended up bringing about quite a bit of content. And I'd love to know what you think down in the comments below. I'd love to know if you are, if you're going to get the digital stamp set. And if you do definitely tag me at notable ink on Instagram and Facebook so that I can see what you're creating with the images. I can't wait to see what people create and their personal take on the images and you may see me repost it in my social media if you tag me. So be sure to tag the image, not just tag me in the comments so that the picture comes to my feed and I'm able to see that and repost it. Here you can see I'm switching up the color family. I mean, these purple flowers were just looking so boring compared to those little speckled eggs down at the bottom. So adding that teal just added a whimsical look to this and kind of brought those flowers to the next level. I'm darkening up the shadows on this one little element here and then this card will be done. Thank you so much for joining me today, you guys. I hope you learned a bunch from all of these tips and you found them helpful. If you did, give me a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any new releases, particularly digital stamp sets or even photopolymer stamp sets.